yourself shortly, and we can start with uh, uh, Benedictus over there. I'm Benedictus Agdalon is my name, and I just completed my master's degree in project management. And prior to that, I had to migrate to Berlin to be able to undertake my um, degree. And um, in the course of that, I also realized that there was a need after seeing um, a development here, which was actually like students being able to work and earn some money, I also felt that it was actually something we could actually do in Africa to curb migration. So um, I think your earlier question was about getting um, uh, two Afri uh, European Union and African Union to collaborate and help with migration issues here. And was, that was one of the driving factors for me to be able to come up with the student job opportunities, which is um, one project I'm starting now, to help students be able to get some internship and work and give them um, the job market ready after they are completed their self um, their education. So moving forward in this direction brought me to um, the topic we are talking about now, and I'm quite passionate about it because it also serves as um, a guide way through the sustainability goals, which is um, the first one, which is no poverty, education, and also gender equality. And yeah, this is how I've come across um, my stay here and what I'm doing so far. And, and just to add up, what was your motivation for joining the Migrant Media Network? Um, of course, I just said it now, and it's actually because I felt that if people are moving, they need to be informed. They need to have a skilled labor before they move. You cannot just move like that. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was one of the most passionate things for me to join it because just giving the people the much information they needed to give them an informed, to make an informed decision was um, paramount to the subject matter. So I think it was something I actually was happy about to join and also give back to the society of what I've learned. So I was passionate about giving it back. That's why I joined you. Well, thank you. And yes. Yeah, okay. So I, as I've already said, I'm Fortune Agili and uh, a political scientist um, working in Bible. Okay. I think I, I wasn't part of, I was part of those, uh, that train, but I couldn't uh, make it to travel. But I think I, being familiar with the, the context that we are going to be talking about, that's why I think you have to mention also you have presented your paper in the USA on, on, on oh, this yeah. particular uh, yeah, sure. yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 yeah, I I as I indicated earlier on I have background in public policy and governance and development and so I do a lot of a lot of things in that regard. Thank you, welcome and thank you And then we move to Mr. Desmond. Uh, my name is Desmond Aluma. Uh, I am here in Germany to pursue a master in Public management in the University of Barcelona. Uh, so I'll combine the motivation question here so that people can actually be fast. So I come from the extreme northeastern part of Ghana, uh, which is uh, part of the, the country that is a bit cut away from the main, and there is actually little of development, and some cases not at all. So growing up, it was really quite difficult to have access to school. I, I had to actually uh, disobey my parents at a point to take myself to school. But then, at a point, I realized that it was just me who got the courage to do this, not the majority. And so there are still so many people of my age and younger ones who are still in this same kind of struggle. So I started uh, an organization which was just a youth movement somewhere in 2009, and it was called the Pragmatic Youth uh, Empowerment Movement. And the purpose was just to empower people. Then, somewhere around uh, the same time, we had these issues of young people always trying to go to Libya, and then we had some of our brothers who actually made it through, and uh, they were falling home. So it was kind of a motivation for a lot of people to travel. But not so long, then we also started to hear a lot of news about some brutalities in this country and the fact that some of these brothers were actually losing their lives. 
So we fa I decided to factor in uh, the issues of migration into uh, the, the, things, the activities that we were doing. So every time we gather, we talk about migration, and then we look up to people who can share information with us concerning migration. So I've been very, very uh, biased in terms of migration for quite a long time because of this kind of experience. And myself, I was actually looking into options to also exploit this uh, migration journey because, of course, if you don't have the opportunities and you know that you hear that there are opportunities elsewhere you want to go. So when I got here and then uh, MMN uh, were doing this particular project, I really felt connected because if you are already working in the area and then now they brought you an opportunity, why not? So I embraced it. Uh, and I also uh, developed an NGO which is now focused on environment, but we still factor in the youth empowerment perspective. So I said I will leverage my network in the country and then utilize this as an opportunity to go back to spread the news. Yeah, you have also to mention about your engagement in the United Nations. Yeah, uh, so it, 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 that, is, that is also uh, part uh, yeah, and the focal point for green economy for the UN major group for young people, uh, children and youth. But I also end that because of the work I do with youth empowerment and also environment. So my focus is rural innovation because I try as much as possible to make sure to give people a reason to achieve their dreams in the rural communities rather than having to travel. Uh, because personally, I didn't like to go and stay in Accra when I was growing up. That was not part of me. But then I had to do that because uh, other than that, you, you are, your dreams are more like dead. So when I got the opportunity, I wanted to also give people the kind of empowerment that they can stay in their communities. And then I uh, think that was a, a, a more of a recognition that you are doing something. So they gave me that role. Hello, Mosley. Just arrived from Ghana. You can tell us yeah, more about that as well. Yes, that's true. My name is Cosmos uh, Lambini. I'm from Northern Ghana, like this uh, one just mentioned. Uh, I've lived in Germany for over 12 to 13 years. Uh, I came to do my master's, but as a child, I always had a dream that I wanted to, not to come to Germany, but to leave my village and to leave my community to get abroad. So, but I couldn't reach my, <clears throat> I couldn't reach quickly this goal because I was still like 10 or 12, <laughs> dreaming because of magazines. I was like, okay, I want to see this nice place that looks completely different from where I grew up. So. Um, my parents supported me uh, to go to school, so I went to the university in Ghana and then fortunately had a scholarship to come down to do my master's in Berlin, uh, Erasmus School's master's in rural development. And after my studies, went back to Ghana and um, I've done a couple of projects on sustainability in the agricultural sector and also in the forest sector. But my main passion for joining this workshop um, is because of my childhood. I, like I said, I've always had a dream to travel and having met my dream of traveling and seeing how life is abroad, the goods and the bads, uh, I wanted to go back to my community to tell them what I think is the truth. Um, and I did this, first of all, by setting up uh, a community-based organization in my community, in the northern part, uh, it's called the Anoshe Group, which I've been working with the Steve Tong from Stuttgart for seven years, basically empowering women in agribusiness. Um, and during the workshop, I think one of the key messages that we developed or that the participants themselves developed is that they have realized that coming to Europe, of course, is an option, but it's not the only option. The option that they see at the moment is their country, their land, their communities that they want to build. That is the passion that they have. But this is also restrictive. It's not just about having a dream that you cannot really reach. They would like to get assistance from, from the government, because that's why we have government. They would like to get support from the government to help them build their, their businesses. 
at the moment this is not being done by the government. Uh, there are NGOs that are helping. It's still not enough and during the discussions one of the key messages that I got from participants was that they would like to stay in the country but with up with some financial incentive with with new ways to make money in their communities. So at, I believe because of the project that was also set up in, 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 in the Anosha group, they are all farmers and they grow their own crops. They are able to make enough money just with agriculture. And with this, they would like to replicate it or scale it up. So, I mean, the workshop was extremely useful to all the participants. In my case, I organized three separate workshops, total of 75 participants. And they were all very happy for the Migration Media Network training because they, they learned a lot. Some of the information that we gave, they knew it, but at least hearing it from us as the aspirants made them to believe in it that, well, this is true, that when you when you are here, it's very hard. That was my key message. Very, very, very hard. You are alone. You have to struggle on your own. Your mom is not there. Your dad is not there. No sisters, no friends. Um, so you are you you can become any any bad person. You can become, you can switch to drugs. You can switch to uh, alcohol. You can you can become a very bad person in Europe. So the messages were were, were quite uh, personal, and and, and 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 I think they also got it. And so, so we'll come to 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 to, to these misconceptions and messages once more, and even personal stories. But before that, this one. Yeah, hi. Um, <clears throat> my name is Bismuth. Um, I also have an agricultural background, like um, Cosmos. Um, I studied agriculture because um, um, I like to see things grow. Um, from childhood, it was interesting to see how things you put things on the in the soil and then it grows into something else. So I like to see things things grow. So um, I studied agriculture and then. Um, I had a chance to study my, for my master's in in Bonn, uh, in the area of agricultural economics. Um, then uh, I went back to Ghana to, to work. I worked with the GIZ um, for about six and a half years um, on different on a, on a project, but in different capacities. Where initially worked in project project um, monitoring and evaluation of, of um, one of the projects, and also later on. I was involved working with the Ministry of Food and Agriculture in terms of agricultural policy advice. Um, I also had, as part of my work, um, issues relating to gender and, and things like that. Um, so um, then, afterwards, I I had to I, I came back here in Germany to start a doctoral program um, at the University of Leipzig, where I'm, again I'm researching on entrepreneurship within the agricultural sector because. Um, I feel um, agribusiness is a big space for us in, in my country. Um, a lot of people are working within that cultural space, but the agribusiness part has not been really um, um, explored. And so I think that that is an area where a lot of focus can go in, and that's why my research is, is, is in that field. Um, personally, as well, I, I have um, the passion for youth development uh, because in our space, um, especially growing up in an area where I grew up, which is more like, um, like it's a place called Ashaiman, which is an, uh, an urban space, but uh, uh, we have a lot of poor people. And so as a, as a young person, you have to weave your way uh, through because there are very few opportunities. There is a lot of crime. So, I, mean, those are, I mean, things have improved drastically since, like, but now compared to my childhood, but these are areas where a lot of young people didn't have a lot of opportunities. And so I, people that I know and I grew up with um, ended up in the, right, in the wrong places because of wrong decisions and because there wasn't a lot of guidance for the youth. And I, that is one of the things that I like, um, I enjoy doing in terms of helping the youth to make the right decision because I believe our lives as people are based on the decisions we make at every point in time, whether it's positive or not. And these decisions have consequences. They could be positive uh, or negative. So 
um, in helping people to make right, young people to make the right decisions, one by doing that, you help to shape their lives and they have a better future. So that is one of the passion and that's one of the reasons why I decided to get on board this project because um, this decision to migrate um, is about aspirations, it's about desires because it is not wrong for any of us to say, I want to have a good life, I want to have that car or I want to live in this house. It is not really wrong. It's just that how, as we have heard this morning, based on the information you have, you make a decision based on that. And so people who, for instance, make the decision to go through the irregular route is based on the information they have and because they decide to trust in that information and act based on what they have. So I think that by the fact that I want, um, I have passion for the youth to make right decisions at important stages of their lives. That is why I think that being part of this project is something that has helped me to contribute or to still give to something that I'm passionate about. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me on the video. Very interesting um, um, life stories and experiences at the same time. Now, just jumping exactly to what you said about access to information and information that people have. Uh, what do you think are the, 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 the common misconceptions people have in regard to migration in general? Okay, to, to, to start off... I especially think, in Ghana. Yeah, now. especially in Ghana, I think that um, um, there is this um, uh, misconception or, um, about the fact that um, uh, it is difficult to travel using the right route. Mm -hmm. um, people are afraid, for instance, to go to the um, embassies mm -hmm. because the, the you know because when going there, the, 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 because of the formalized mm -hmm. processes and stuff. People are, are afraid. Somehow they have this fear. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, for instance, in the workshop, mm -hmm. I asked what are some of the, the things that people have heard about, for instance, Germany. Mm -hmm. And then one of the key things I kept hearing was that oh, getting a German visa is so difficult. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when you have gotten a German visa, it's like wow, you you know because they they feel that it is so difficult. It's just that I think that um, people don't have the right information. They don't know. For instance, how to prepare, what to prepare, and all that. So the one of the misconceptions is that it's difficult to travel the right way. That's that's one one of the things. The other thing, like, is this our general um, linear thinking where we think that everything is rosy, mm -hmm. everything is, is fine. Because in the workshops, one of the questions that I asked, you know, the workshop was how many people want to travel outside the country, mm -hmm. and I tell you. In all the workshops, you had like 90% of the people saying they want to travel. Of course, their destinations were varying, mm -hmm. you know. But a lot of them said, yeah, I think life is better in Europe for me than it's here in, in my country. So there is still that thinking that, yeah, um, um, to do it, to make it in life, like from our, our, our circles, mm -hmm. you have to get out of the country to make it in life. But I mean, if you talk to them, then you get them to understand that I mean there are opportunities that you probably have not seen. So uh, maybe my other colleagues would add, but mm -hmm. these these first to the fact that they think traveling the right way is difficult, mm -hmm. and then also the fact that they think that you can only make it abroad. abroad. Is, does this misconception differ to the view, or? I just I think I also want to add to that. Mm -hmm. I think even when it comes to the formal ways of traveling, mm -hmm. it's not only I don't think it's only a misconception that mm -hmm. it's difficult. I mm -hmm. think sometimes meeting the requirements can be difficult. The requirements of you having to of traveling mm -hmm. can be difficult. Mm -hmm. Even if you're <coughs> traveling as a student. There are many cases I am um, at a point one of the after my masters, one of the initial um, one of the places I worked was with the GAAD, mm -hmm. that's the German, uh, that's the Deutsche yeah. Akademische mm -hmm. Austausch yeah. thing. Um, um, and there are people who come, they have admissions. Mm -hmm. They want to, they, they have been accepted into master's programs that mm -hmm. they want to pursue here mm -hmm. in Germany. And, and sometimes they are not able to meet the requirement to be able to start the program. Mm -hmm. And usually you are required to open an account here mm -hmm. in Deutsche Bank you're supposed to have um, that's about seven thousand euros. Mm -hmm. That is that is the estimated amount of money that the uh, the embassy thinks you need mm -hmm. 
to cover for your cost of living in a year. Mm -hmm. Not only do you have to show proof that mm -hmm. you don't only open that account and put the seven thousand mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. but you also have to then, then show proof that the program is two years. You have to show proof that for the second year, this is how you're going to finance it. Mm -hmm. And so it's usually difficult. Mm -hmm. I can share one story, for instance, with you. I, I have one friend of mine mm -hmm. who he, he's been a childhood friend. He's doing very well, mm -hmm. very very well by all standards. Mm -hmm. yes. He has now, I think recently, he has built six apartments. He's rented out. Two years or three years ago, when I, when I was here, I thought, okay, I want to invite him because this is someone I he he he, he has money. He, he's not coming to Europe to stay. But unfortunately, in his life story, he's not had successes with um, with business. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. In the only places he's been to is South Africa and Dubai. But apart from that, UK and the others, he just wants to come and just see the place, mm -hmm. not because he wants to stay. Mm -hmm. So I decided to invite him, and he went for the interview. <coughs> he was not given. He was not given. He had he showed an account of the money, but it's because he has business. So they have they have difficulties in regards to exactly. the visa so processes. That's what's given. Exactly. Yeah. So you see that it's sometimes it's not just the misperception, but sometimes some of the, there are some elements of truth, truth no, in these exactly. perceptions in, in that the legal requirements sometimes, and yeah, they just told him sorry, we we we, we can't be. I mean. I, mm -hmm. So where there are some where there's some truth in this misconception in regard to the difficulties of processing and getting a visa, that is very much true. Yeah. But um, there are maybe other also misconceptions that yeah. I think apart from the entry mm -hmm. process being difficult, mm -hmm. one of the at least from my workshop, one of the biggest misconceptions that they the participant at least uh, got me to to understand mm -hmm. was that once you arrive here mm -hmm. You have everything. Mm. You have job mm. available mm. because they believe that in Germany, if you if you will find a job, you can mm. clean, you will make millions of Ghanaian cities, you can drive a bus, you can uh, even be a security guard mm. or yeah, many other jobs that in Ghana you will do, and maybe at the end of the month you get just ten or fifteen euros mm -hmm. and. Um, in Germany, you might get probably uh, I don't know, thousand euros. Mm -hmm. So for them coming here, you definitely get economic uh, gains through jobs, mm -hmm. um, and also they also most of them believe that getting uh, a wife mm -hmm. or getting papers mm -hmm. through uh, dating mm -hmm. uh, is also through what through dating. Dating, dating. okay, yeah, it's also very very easy. So, so you come and meet a wife waiting for you? Yeah, you're, I mean, <laughs> because you're African, uh, you believe that I mean, here there are not many Africans, they don't know that we are living here. <laughs> okay. Once you arrive, uh, you yes, find a wife husband or okay. uh, a wife or whatever. Okay. So, and I told them, well, guys, these are all false. I have lived in Germany and I know how difficult it is to find a girl. <laughs> Pops <laughs> upon pops, it's not, it's not, it's, it's very hard. And, uh, so, but how do you communicate such? So, just in regard to overcoming these misconceptions and all that, how do you overtake the, the position of telling someone, Oh, when you come to Germany, you have to look for a job like other Germans, you have to, you have to provide the right papers. You, you know, there are, there are no women waiting for you at the airport to marry. So how do you communicate that? And what are the barriers of that? I think, I mean, this is the whole base for the truth telling. Mm -hmm. Because if they hear this from from the diaspora community, mm -hmm. they know that you can lie to them. I mean, they trust in you, mm -hmm. so they believe in, in most of the information that you, you share with them. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think uh, to be able to communicate this to, to, to participants or to the youth, it's basically getting the right mm -hmm. people and the right channel mm -hmm. to send this information. This is, this is the only way. There's no bullet or uh, magic point of how to communicate. But for example, Benedictus, one experience I have is that when you go there and try to tell people, I'm a diaspora, 
and I go to Kenya and tell people, please, 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 think twice before you travel. They tell me, you are there, why don't we come? Mm -hmm. <laughs> How do you overcome that? Yes, I mean, you tell them the purpose. Everybody has a purpose in life, and yeah. it's also part of the aspiration. Mm -hmm. So once they get to know the purpose of them, they know their own purpose, mm -hmm. you tell them, okay, it's, it's fine, you can come and do it this way, mm -hmm. and you also try to show them the alternative routes mm -hmm. and the alternative means of making it back home. Mm -hmm. And this is actually where we found it very interesting. Mm -hmm. I think most of my colleagues can attest to that, that mm -hmm. at the end of the um, at the end of the workshop, yes. those who the ninety percent of the people who wanted to come mm -hmm. to Europe, to travel to Europe, mm -hmm. now reverse their decisions and say, Okay, yeah, I'm staying, I'm not going anywhere mm -hmm. because I, I find here quite interesting mm -hmm. and quite recreative for myself, mm -hmm. for my development and for my growth. And in so you help them to understand that it's a collective idea and a collective decision. Okay. Once we are all able to collectively say that mm -hmm. we are not going to Europe, mm -hmm. we are going to develop our country or our city or our um, region, mm -hmm. so our children or even our family members, the society mm -hmm. can stay, work and get some more money mm -hmm. and be able to satisfy their needs mm -hmm. instead of traveling to Europe. Okay. And um, about the misconceptions, I would want to add. I would want to add that most of the people think it is easier to move freely when you travel to Europe or wherever you get to. You can travel anywhere you want. After reaching Germany, you can go to USA. You can go to Australia. You can go everywhere. So they think there's free movement here. So when you arrive to Germany, you can now choose whatever you go to USA there. Okay, that's yeah. interesting. And also, one, one of the actually one of the misconceptions among the potential migrants is they actually don't know or they think that everyone is going to the same place. Yes, like, mm -hmm. they think, for example, if you have about three to four people mm -hmm. who wants to travel, mm -hmm. because they think this guy is going to America, they all say, okay, then I'm going to America. But in the in, in the in the the first guy's mind, he is not going to America. Mm -hmm. He is going to somewhere he can actually make a good living. Mm -hmm. So this actually lures them to thinking that America or this particular place is good for them without them knowing and having the adequate information mm -hmm. on where to go to. Mm -hmm. And I think it's actually a, a misconception amongst them. So that means how do we do that then? Do you, what could you suggest? Do you think a conversation or a... I think I think being visible enough mm -hmm creates the awareness. Of course, if someone wants an information, the person needs to see it, or hear it, or be able to access it. And that's the access point we're talking about. I think with the USSD, mm -hmm. it's quite efficient. And also with the pickup points, you can get information wherever they, they, they go to, or in their locality. Mm -hmm. Also, um, having um, presentations over the radio to advertise, the USSDs as well as the pickup points mm -hmm. have been, uh, for example, there was um, a program we, we used to see mm -hmm. when we were growing up, I, I think we've all seen it, it's called um, Greetings from Abroad. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Greetings from Abroad is actually um, a person who hosts, who travels to host countries mm -hmm. to have a short interview mm -hmm. with the migrants there okay. to send messages back home. So every Saturday or Sunday, everyone is eager to go and watch this program see because you will probably see your family member. <laughs> yeah. okay. we'll see the relatives. And hope to see the relatives. Yes. Yeah, but uh, just going back to, to your times and to the training that you did in Ghana, yeah. and just to see if there were any personal stories. So did you listen to the reasons why those participants attended these workshops? And were these reasons and motivations different in any regard <coughs> for men, to men and women? So did they differ on the reasons, first of all, on why they migrate? And did they differ in reasons, for example, why they want to learn more about these topics? Yeah, obviously. Mm -hmm. Mr. Preston, uh, I, I think one, one, my second workshop mm -hmm. had uh, more girls mm -hmm. uh, than, than, than guys, and that actually caused me to treat the, the way mm -hmm. I had planned. So mm -hmm. it was more of a design thinking approach rather than the previous one that I, I did. Mm -hmm. And this was because uh, for some most of these girls, their kind of motivation was, mm -hmm. was far different in, from a lady's perspective. Uh, for example, we already had one of them who had a personal story from a friend, and this friend was engaged with uh, 
uh, a minor mm -hmm. uh, who is a Chinese and had promised to bring her to Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, uh, this the lady got pregnant mm -hmm. for the minor, but the, uh, the minor never came back. Mm -hmm. uh, he kept saying, when I come back, I will take you to Spain. Mm -hmm. I will take you to Spain. But then when she said she was pregnant, the, the man didn't come back. And then, but originally for them, they thought that for as a lady, the opportunity was once you get to, to Europe, mm -hmm. you will get a man to marry you. Mm -hmm. And once you get a man to marry you, then you have the opportunity to stay and to get uh, visa and work to do. So that was one of the motivations, rather than the, the usual motivation of young people, they just seeking uh, greener pastures. But aside this, the other aspect was also uh, the fact that most of them felt like he, uh, he, he was mentioning, most of them felt that once you get there, there is, uh, everything is, is rosy. And uh, I just want to, to, to add this. You see, there are several strategies to market. Mm -hmm. And one thing that was intriguing for me that I'd never really thought of until I met these people was the fact that when you go to the American embassy in Ghana, you always see a very long queue outside mm -hmm. of the embassy, all people seeking to get visa. So when I started with the facts about on the ground, how difficult it is, and then I said that, Oh, the thing is, wherever it looks really green, you have to work extra hard. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the people have to work extra hard because there's always living cost is expensive and you have to always work mm -hmm. and have to, to work that way in order to survive. But if you work the same way here, you will survive. But they tell me if it is that difficult like I'm talking about, why is it that there are always these queues mm -hmm. outside and people want to go in, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think people have diverse ways of motivation. And sometimes, sometimes, this kind of motivation makes them not to even really reflect and think about the exact things that they will do when they get to the ground. Mm -hmm. So because we are running out of time, I could just ask you, um, each of you to have at least one minute to just say, what do you think in terms of migration and information was first of all the most important uh, information resource that can be used? And secondly, what do you think should be in, should be changing the to migration and policy, not only by the, the Ghana as a country of origin, but also transit countries and destination countries. I know it's a very long question, but probably if you have one 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 thing that you could really change today, what would that be? We start with you. Yeah, um, I think one one of the, the things that um, like the the, tr the training was on social media. Mm -hmm. And migration and I think that was one of the key things that for a lot of the young people who came was a driving factor because we're talking about social media which is something that everybody is in there <coughs> not long I mean not long after the training that I had there was this fake news mm -hmm. on, on, on the death I saw a fake news post by somebody on Facebook who of the death of um, the rock I don't know Dwayne Johnson I don't know the American mm -hmm. and immediately I saw it I knew that it was fake when the guy posted it, I replied like I told him that that information was fake. And I said that I invited him to the workshop, but if he had come, he would have known that that information was fake. And then there was somebody else who was in the workshop who said, yes, I saw it and I didn't share it because I saw and based on the information that I got from the workshop, I was able to tell that this information was fake. For me, that was like a big statement because this is somebody who had just participated in a workshop where we gave information on how to spot fake information, how to um, see what is real and what is fake. And then by that, he was able to apply that on something that had just come out. So I think that um, social media is one of them where we can take advantage of. We have trained quite a number of people and there, are, there is somehow people who can serve as a network mm -hmm. that we can use to multiply this information. And I think that is one of the, of the, of the avenues that we can use. In terms of um, policy-wise, um, I think also if we are able to um, some way find alternatives for people, as I said, it is not wrong for people to say, I want to have a better life. But if I can make that life in Ghana, for me, it is it is it, it will be motivating for me to even stay in Ghana than here because I I yes I'm I'm living in Germany now but 
I would always, if there's an alternative, I would always, I would prefer to live in Ghana. You know, so, and for most people, we want to be close to our families. We want to be so, and if they're able to make alternative lives in terms of getting um, jobs, in terms of entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. is, because now also the entrepreneurial drive is coming, is pushing up in Ghana. You have a lot of young people who are trying things, but there isn't a system that would shield them from the shocks of entrepreneurship. And I mean, if you are if you're an entrepreneur here, you know that there are a lot of shocks. And a lot of people, because of these shocks, are not able to uh, really get into it. But that is also one thing that we can, um, in terms of policy-wise, find ways of supporting new businesses, which will create jobs for, 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 for a lot of, like I said, agriculture is one of the ways. There are a lot of opportunities in there, which will feed other industries or other sections mm -hmm. of, the, of, the, of the, the markets that we have. So that is also one one of the um, I think we agree that yeah. we need yeah. to yeah. look yeah. at the alternatives yeah. to... Can I quickly jump into this before Cosmos answers no. the question? Let's, 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 let's finish this. <laughs> about agriculture and no. I would like to touch uh, that up a bit somehow. So, since both of you has agriculture background and um, we're saying like most African migrants come here with aspiration, how can we make this uh, aspiration reality at home? Like how can we make agriculture a success at home? Maybe so Cosmos will take that up and So, answer. for example, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, seven years ago, I started with a small agribusiness uh, with 50 women. And basically, we, we try to empower these women by providing them with inputs, agricultural inputs, tractor services, uh, the best seeds that they could, they could use in, in, the, in, in, in the community, and also the best extension uh, services provided by our organization. And within for now, like seven years to date, the group has grown uh, to almost 550, mm -hmm. and each household within within this project are very, very satisfied economically. So they have money enough money to at least send <coughs> one child or two of their children to school and also pay for their health insurance. And it's not it wasn't costly to run a project like this. With each household, we needed just 25 euros to to organize tractor services for them and they just needed it and these were women that were very restricted in in, 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 in this community in, in, the, in the cultural setting so i think agri agri business has strong uh, opportunity to tap into uh, government already knows it but sorry i'm always mentioning government because i really think in our context uh, i see the government as the only Avenue uh, for for bringing economic growth because private sector is very small, and so the whole chunk of uh, blame or whatever game should go to the government. They have to. They have. They raise revenue um, through taxation to exactly. to build the country. So they should be able to provide uh, services mm -hmm. that will help the locals and the community to grow. So, sorry for cutting you short, yeah. but because I, I have to, we have three layers on time, and there's another event taking place here. I have to jump uh, to, to just finish quickly. Yeah, we, we really, I mean, we want to also have a response yeah. from, yeah. from Glenn. It would be good if we could get a couple minutes in for her. Yeah. We can do five more minutes, but then we really have to break and eat and network. And exactly. So, <laughs> I just would like to ask uh, just what you are, are you the organization which deals with climate change? And, um, there is one thing that we have to, have to, to recognize, climate change contributes in, in very many ways to migration and migration um, as, as, a root cause, as a root cause of migration at the same time. So what is your organization doing in this case and as a solution to these uh, particular uh, challenges that we face due to climate change? So we have three projects. Uh, one is on waste management. Mm -hmm. uh, we just found a way to convert waste into resource. Mm -hmm. So for the past two years, we have young people that we have trained to make rainbows, mm -hmm. to make uh, shopping bags, to make different kind of artifacts from this waste. Mm -hmm. That is to control not only the flooding and other issues, but also to make income. Mm -hmm. Then we have the youth in agri, mm -hmm. where we have uh, we connect retiring farmers, farmers who are getting old in the system, with a lot of the young people who didn't want to go into a grip mm -hmm. in the first place because these retired farmers have a lot of knowledge about how to really increase your yield and 
we, these young people don't have so much knowledge. We connect them to have easy access to man and to have easy access to knowledge. So in a way, we are paying the, farm, the, the retired farmer and then also the, the, the youth farmer is also getting money. Now, our other thing is how do we make all this climate friendly? There has been the problem of over-reliance on synthetic fertilizer mm -hmm. in the country and the government think that the best way to support farmers is to subsidize synthetic fertilizer. Mm -hmm. But along this uh, pro program, it has led to the reduction or the degrading of soil biodiversity, mm -hmm. which is a typical outcome of the climate change. Mm -hmm. So what we do is now to support these farmers to concentrate on nature-based solutions and how to regenerate soil biodiversity. And once the soil or the land is fertile again, everybody else can have uh, something to do. Okay, thank you so much. Fortune, I have to come back to you. Yes. As a representative in this whole main group of the human, what do you think has to be changed in order to give the right information to the to young, to young women in regard to migration and migration information? Yeah, exactly what I have put here. I think there's a need for... Can I also jump in? Because I also have a question for you, so you can give us uh, okay. an answer for both of us. So, um, we say that, uh, a couple of you said that, um, that uh, um, the migration from Africa is as aspiration, it's <coughs> economical, and but then you, there are these also two um, stories being told uh, by Cosmos and uh, Desmond that uh, the, the women migrants talked about how they come to Europe and uh, and some man waiting for them and to marry a man. I really find and I'm struggling with this uh, story because uh, is that the only aspiration the Ghanaian women have or I also would like uh, Fortune to, to give me some <laughs> input with this. Uh, yeah, so, so definitely that's not a, a, an example. Yeah. My aspiration was not to come to Europe and marry, even though I met my husband in Europe. <laughs> no. um, so yes, so let me start with, um, so I think I, I jotted it down, I think generally um, there's a need for policy makers to look at a gender dimension to the issue of migration because it affects women. Like um, reading for um, preparing Going back to the scale, um, um, scaling French report from it shows that women, for instance, tend to pay more, far, far much more, mm -hmm. for to embark on these journeys. I, I even so, for instance, them it cost women three thousand nine hundred euros, while their male counterpart pay like two thousand seven hundred, the two thousand three hundred seventy euros. You can just see that the, the gap in that. So it costs for the women. In terms of monetary cost, it's high. Mm -hmm. The same way in terms of even the risk, as the story you shared, mm -hmm. it's, it's the standard. For the women, you, 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 the chances of you being sexually abused is like 80, 90%. Unless you have extra, extra money to pay your way out. It's, it's, it's the, so the, the huge for women is more, the, the, huge, the, the cost for women is more, far more for the men than for men. And so there's a need that policy interventions in this area think really about having a, these gender dimensions. Definitely the aspirations for women, in Ghanaian women in Ghana is not to travel to marry. For that group of women that they are referring to, these are women that usually maybe do not have, they have very, maybe they, they even dropped out of primary school. Or they, they they have senior high school, but they have no skills. Or even if they have skills, they have very low perspective. It's like that is their only option. But even undertone that is the aspiration to make it. So he's not only thinking, oh, I want to come and marry and have a child, and that is it. But rather, at least I get the stay. So in, usually, it's not just to come and marry. That marriage is to give you the certificate to stay. And in, and in most cases, you see that even in some of these marriages, it's usually the initial years. After two, three years, when they get their papers, they yeah. leave. Yeah. And yeah. They, they, then they move on. So that is not the way. I, a lot of Ghanaian women, a lot of Ghanaian women have big aspirations to make it work. And that is not the only way. I would like to finish on that point. There is a need for gender dimensions on that. And um, if you allow me, Benedictus, we will close at this point. Um, it's because time is not on our side. So. 
One of the one of the summaries is there is a need for policy to include gender dimensions in addressing migration and migration issues. It is very important to address the resources that we have, and agriculture being one of the biggest one of the biggest strong points for very many African countries. It's very good to explore that, and not just in agriculture but innovative agriculture, including and making sure that we put climate change as, as a focus point. Um, and the other thing, addressing social media and social, and social media as, a, as one tool of talking and um, spreading out information is very important and informing people about how to, co to consume this information seems to be a very logical and very effective manner. So thank you guys for, for this uh, round of applause. And